Welcome back to the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Gary. Choices. We all have them. As a kid, one of the most stressful times of life, it seemed, was going to Baskin and Robbins, the ice cream shop that touted its 31 flavors. There were so many choices, and it was never easy. Standing on your tippy toes, face pressed against the glass, peering through the condensation at the ice cream choices in the big tubs, the pressure was on. What would it be this time? The Rocky Road? The Mint Chip? Or one I loved in that I think is pretty gross as an adult, the bubblegum ice cream, complete with gumballs that I would excavate from the ice cream, lick off, and put on a napkin to chew after finishing my cone or cup. Though the bubblegum never quite la- tasted right and seemed to have lost its chew in the dairy freezing process or something. But the choices, it was really hard. So you debate in your head, waver back and forth until finally it was your turn to order and you had to commit. So you made a choice and you went with one. Not a big deal in the grander scheme of things and you could always choose another flavor next time around, but it seemed oh so important right there in the moment. And as tough as those choices were at the ice cream counter as a kid, it hasn't gotten any easier. It's estimated that the average adult makes more than 35,000 decisions per day. From the small and insignificant choices like what should I wear today to does this night need ironing or to decaf or regular or to what show do I watch tonight? to the bigger and weightier decisions. Which bill do I pay this month? Or do I stay in this marriage and try just a little bit, a little, little bit longer? Or do I turn a blind eye to what I just saw? Or even to, do I open up to someone about what I'm holding inside? Decisions, choices every single day. They're a part of life. Varying degrees, varying implications, but decisions nonetheless. Decisions are something that God gave us. Free moral agency to make choices, even if it means what ice cream we want to order. But he took a big gamble when he gave man the right to decide to submit and obey. To our Creator's authority, to his commands, and to his guidelines for living. And it's in those areas that decisions have some of the biggest implications, and that mankind has flubbed the most if we look at the world, past, present, and undoubtedly the future too. We're in part two of a teaching we started on the last podcast, in case you need to go back to listen to that one. Part one in which we considered the subject of abortion, a decision that rejects God as the giver of life. And we started at the foot of the cross, where Jesus proclaimed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. As the crowd gathered and looked on at the crucifixion, none of them realizing the far-reaching implications of what was going on there. They saw the cross as a quick fix to a problem they wanted to go away. The Jews not wanting to confront the truths that Jesus presented about the kingdom of God. The Gentiles uncomfortable with the authority this man Jesus brought to the table. So the cross, the lesser of two evils, or so they thought, not realizing just how far the implications of it would lead. And there in that moment, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And we spoke last time about the enemy, who has found a great tool in abortion, to trick, to trap, and trample on me, often before they've really thought it through at all and considered the full full ramifications of it. As we got to the end of the last podcast and halfway through the teaching recorded recently when I guest speaking at a church, Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. But the thief does not. He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. Satan has go-to tactics, and they are written all over abortion. The first one we looked at last time on the podcast, Satan plays on impatience and pushes us to make decisions quickly without giving time or room for God to work. Something we definitely see in abortion is people seek to take care of the, quote, the problem as quickly as possible. We also considered last time that Satan motivates by fear. Fear in areas like finances or fear of others who don't want them to have a child or even fear of upholding a reputation. Someone after the service when this message was recorded approached me and told me a story about when he was an administrator at a high school. And he got to work early one morning and a female student came to him breaking down and she told him that she was pregnant and was afraid because she was the preacher's daughter. What would people and her parents say? Well, this male administrator enlisted the help of a female counselor. They talked the girl through it and challenged her to tell her parents within the next week or else they would need to pass the news on themselves. Within a few days, the preacher and his wife were there with their daughter in the principal's office, thanking him for stepping in and helping remove the fear and staying silent that this girl had. The girl, a junior at the time, went on to have her baby and was back her senior year to graduate with her class. So many heavy stories when it comes to abortion, but so many stories of redemption and restoration too. 
something we'll consider on this episode of the podcast, we'll pick up with looking at more tactics of the enemy that fit right into the abortion narrative. If you haven't listened to the last verbatim word episode called Life, I encourage you to go back and do so in season three, episode 15, as this is the second part of a sermon recorded live at a church on a Sunday morning. And if you have kids who are listening with you, you might want to preview the podcast before sharing it with younger listeners, depending on what you've already shared with them on the topic. But it's an important message for today's world and for the church. So let's pick up where we left off last time. Satan lies and tells us that we have no options, so we must sin. Our only choice is to do something that we would rather not do or we'd normally not do, but because of our circumstances, that's the only option we have. We've been backed into a corner, and we have no options. That we must take things into our own hands, and it's all up to us. That God has abandoned us. We got into this mess, and we're going to have to get ourselves out. We're tempted to panic and think that we have no other way. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, which was a town with lots of carnality, and pagan worship all around. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. God has alternatives that these women need to hear, because Satan tells us we have no options, but there are options. How many ways God can be glorified in an unwanted pregnancy? With adoption, for example, it's estimated there are, there are one to two million couples in the United States right now waiting to adopt. If you do the statistics, that's 36 couples waiting for every one baby that is put up for adoption. There's a great need for adoption. When we were in Slovenia, the climate was with pregnancies because uh, with socialism and, and, and socialized kind of thinking and some of the economics of there, if your baby was not going to be perfect, then that was kind of a, a hindrance to you or to your economic well-being. So they would test throughout pregnancy. And if at any point something came up that was pointing that this may not be a viable pregnancy or the baby may have some um, deformities or something might not be right, wrong or something might not be right, they would encourage you to, to end that pregnancy. And we had a woman in our church who came and asked for prayer because she went for some of these tests and it showed up that she had toxis, toxoplasmosis, you know, the cat, you get it from the cat litter and, and things like that. And they couldn't track down when she had contracted it. Well, if she'd contracted it before a certain time, then the first trimester could have influenced the baby and all this and all that. And they couldn't really figure out the math. But the medical advice to her was, your child will be born deformed. You need to end this pregnancy. Well, she wrestled in faith, and she asked us to pray, and, and she made the choice to, to have that child, and the child is totally fine. The child is a, a rebellious teenager just like he should be. Let's pray for him. We need, he needs our prayer as well. In the counseling room, though, there at, co- at that Crossroads Clinic, that is one part of the conversation, is to let them know that there are options. First of all, let's talk about the physical ramifications of abortion. Let's talk about the emotional side effects. Let's talk about the, the mental side effects, or the relational side effects, and if you're open to it, can we talk about the faith side of it as well? Because especially in a place like Oklahoma, many people do have faith in their past. And they're, they're pushing that aside or they're pushing it to the background. And they know in their conscience that maybe this is something that God would not have them do. But they're pressing forward anyway. And it's amazing how many of them, once that conversation opens up, break down knowing already that what they're doing is stepping against what God would have for them. In this year, Aaron shared some statistics, but by mid-August, since the beginning of the year, at Crossroads, we've shared the gospel with 284 clients, and 82 of them have professed faith in Christ. So we know that it's, it's not just about changing their decision for this decision. It's about making the most important decision of their life, to call the Lord the Lord of their life. Another thing, Satan seeks to block you from God's best. Many people facing this crisis think, I'm not ready to be a mother, I'm not ready to be a father, I would not make a good father, I would not make a good mother, or they're told by life and society that they're not ready yet, they can't do it, they don't have the resources to provide a good home, so isn't it better just to do this instead? You know, God equips us for anything he will call us to. God provides where he guides, and often he will wait until we step out to do so. Think of scripturally, Moses, before he went to Pharaoh, he thought, I can't even speak. The Lord's like, just go. Disciples with the gospel, Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fisher of men, fishers of men, because they weren't fishers of men yet. The disciples in Acts chapter 1, don't leave Jerusalem, don't leave until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I will fill you with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. 
Even for myself in missions, I had never taught a Bible study before I moved on the mission field. It was taking that step of faith where God finally said, okay, good, I will now provide everything that you need. Many don't feel that they're ready to parent. They're not in a place or they have too few resources or they're unfit. They're not ready to do this. But no one feels ready. In our nature, it's in our nature to parent. I called my sister the other day and my three-year-old niece, she said, can I speak to uncle? And so she put her on the phone and she just was jabbering away, talking to me. She's at the age where she just likes to talk and she started playing guessing games. She's like, guess what I have? And I was like, I don't know. And I started just naming things, the remote control. I mean, just anything random. She gave me no hints. And finally she says, I'm holding a baby. I was like, oh, your dolly? She's like, yeah. And she told me the dolly's name. She told me that she has diapers. She told me that's one of those dollies that can actually go number one and number two if you want them to, which I guess is the thing. Um, but in her nature, even at three years old, this nurturing nature to be a parent already coming out. Or, or you see that nature in boys to parent it. It's there. Give them a graham cracker and suddenly it's a gun, right? They bite off corners of it and they're shooting at anything because it's in their nature to, to protect, to step up, to defend. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the, ru- of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. How many resist and reject the biggest gift that God can give, the life of a child? Perhaps the unwanted pregnancy is actually God's tool to mature them, the gift that they need, the turning point of their life, the greatest blessing of the life, the thing that they actually need to step it up, to take responsibility, to be who God wants them to be. The problem is not that they can't be good parents and get their act together. The problem is that they won't change their lifestyle or their habits or their attitudes or they won't repent and be saved or they want to walk in the flesh and not in the spirit because God can equip them to be a godly father or a godly mother and to be exactly what that child needs if they press into it and if they yield to that and if they say, yes, Lord. And we reject the offer the Lord has to grow us and to change us. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Satan also wants to rob us of God's good blessings in life. Children are a heritage from the Lord that we just saw in that verse from Psalms, a gift from God. You know, the infertility rates are, are surprising. Many people cannot conceive. Fertility rates have dropped about 1% per year since the 1960s. So that's 50% in the last 50 years. Sperm counts have dropped by 50% in the last 40 years. And of course, there's various factors, lifestyle, health, chemicals, Any pregnancy conceived should be more and more valuable. The blessing of a pregnancy when others cannot. In addition, Satan's lie to abort robs the blessings in society. Erin's statistics, she came home from a conference recently and and she found out there that one out of every three children from her generation was aborted. One out of every three. So get two people that age, there's one missing. Over 63 million since Roe versus Wade. And there are tremendous implications of God's blessing that have been removed because of that missing generation. The economy, how many taxpayers are not in society right now? Workers, you see all the no ha- now hiring signs. Um, the teacher shortages, the intellectual property that's been missed out on with a third of a generation eradicated. The technology, the medical advances, the politicians with answers for our society, the vaccines and solutions to global problems. The stories of the Tim Tebow's who almost weren't born, if you've ever heard his story. And how many of our families have been robbed personally of the blessing of family? I know someone who's about 40 years old, and he just found out out recently that his parents had an abortion years ago. He has a sibling that's not there. Someone missing from family gatherings, nieces and nephews that he doesn't get to play with. What's missing from many a family tree in our nation and in our world? or from our neighborhood, or from our workplace, or the best friend that you never had. There are lives missing in this world, in history, blessings that God intended to bestow, but we robbed God from giving us the blessing. A life conceived is a blessing God has for us and for this world, and an abortion rejects that blessing and robs that blessing. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Satan has always sought to cut off life sooner rather than later. Think of the Israelites in Egypt around the time of Moses when he was born in Exodus chapter 1, when the midwives were told that they were supposed to stop these babies, these boys, from coming into the world. Well, Moses' mother didn't listen. She put him in a basket in the river and saved an entire nation. And even earlier than that, the pagan nations who did not know God, they were worshiping idols, which are demonic through and through. 
God warned his people against these practices and not being influenced by these. And one of those gods was the God of Moloch. He was the God of pleasure involving the sacrifice of children, where they would put these metal statues in fires and heat them, uh, up, heat them up as hot as they could until the hands of the statues that were outstretched were burning red hot. And then they would place their new children on that altar to let them burn there, sacrificing them to this God of pleasure. And much of that worship had to do with sexual immorality and the children conceived in their, quote, worship of Molech. They were just giving back to this false god the fruit of their worship. There's a number of verses in the Old Testament that refer to Israel and how they had to navigate through this if you're taking notes. Deuteronomy 12, verses 29 through 31. Psalm 106, 35 through 40. But one I want to look at very quickly is Leviticus 20, verses 1 through 5. Leviticus 20, verses 1 through 5, God even spoke to the responsibility, the responsibility of those who allowed such practices to continue in the land and who did nothing about it. It says there in Leviticus, Leviticus 20, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in the Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, that was the child sacrifice God, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man, when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. How blessed we are not to be under the law. And sin has been covered in the cross of Jesus Christ. And yes, child sacrifice is not abortion, but there is just a six-inch difference if a child has passed through that birth canal or not. And while most seeking an abortion are not intentionally worshiping pagan gods, often the decision is made due to the limitations that might bring on those as a result of having the child, or that it's not convenient, I'm not ready, or the circumstances around its conception were not the best, which is making an idol of self and a God of pleasure, and a God of convenience and comfort or education, or the financial side of things, which is making a God of money or mammon. And that warning there was that Israel could not stand back and be complicit. They could not hide their eyes to not demand justice in that area. God said he would set his face against that one and against his family if they did nothing. There is a place for the church to be the salt and light in this area. And there is a ton of ministry to be done, of course, practically supporting those in need who do decide to keep their babies. There are many clinics out there that do diapers and formula, providing for new moms. Crossroads, we focus on the abortion-minded women, then we refer them to other agencies for those sorts of things. But it's a perfect ministry for a church, just like many churches have food banks, letting the community know, hey, we support moms who are struggling. It's a discipleship opportunity. They need people consistently in their lives as they take that step to become a good parent. Extending grace and forgiveness around pregnancies out of wedlock. You know, there are many people who are promiscuous, even in the church. They just don't get caught by a prog positive pregnancy test. Educating people about abortion and ministering to those who are dealing with the results of choosing to abort. Leading them in a path of restoration because there is restoration. And letting them know that Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that's the problem. Many times people don't realize what they've done until after it's already happened. Most of all, though, since it's a spiritual battle, it's not against flesh and blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. One thing that we see at Crossroads is we know that the Holy Spirit is working before they come in the clinic, in that counseling room, and even after they leave. And sometimes even after, after, they, after they've left, even if they are abortion-minded when they leave, there are other people in their lives. There are other people praying for them, and the Holy Spirit gets them many times. We had a situation in the last year that through text messaging and through phone calls, someone from out of state had somehow been referred to the clinic. And through those conversations with one of our counselors, they were able to refer them to a local clinic in their area through some, some networks that we do have. And we just got word recently that even though this teen mom is very young, and the mom at first was just the only choice, the only option we have is abortion, um, she's chosen to keep life. And the Holy Spirit kept working even after those initial conversations. The Holy Spirit does the work of convicting, and he does an awesome job with it. Let every man be slow to speak, slow to wrath, knowing that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. But it's the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin and righteousness and of judging. You know, many have abortion as part of their testimony. 
And God does work all things together for good. That's one thing we're very clear at at Crossroads Clinic is we know that if they leave, even if they, even if they are abortion-minded, our door is still open for them. As Aaron mentioned, there's post abortive counseling. Many will choose still to make that decision. Years down the line, though, they may come to realize that there is grace in Jesus. How many people have abortion as part of their testimony, and God used it as a redemptive part of their life? With the sin of abortion, there's so much shame and guilt because it cannot be undone. But there is restoration and forgiveness, and God can redeem the story. It is not the unpardonable sin. There's a restoration story I know of about a family who, when they were teenagers, um, they had gotten pregnant and circumstances, situations, they were not ready to get married. Um, she was the daughter of a single mom, four kids in the family, and the best choice seemed to abort. So they aborted the child, and years went by, and they finally actually did get married, had two kids, and yet the abortion continued nagging at this woman for years. And she began to, she was not a believer, but she began to pray just wondering if there was forgiveness, if there was restoration for the choice that she had made. And as years went by, she began to, as sometimes we do, start to make um, offers to God. Okay, Lord, well, what about this? And, and if you could do this, and, and her prayer began to be, Lord, if, if you could replace that child, if you could give me a child that, that would be this and would be that. And, and this woman had always felt that, that the child she aborted had been a, a girl. And by that point, she had had two boys. And so she said, Lord, if, if you would give me a baby girl, and if she would be like this and like that and, and like this, and kind of gave her wish list, she said, then I will believe. But I also know that you do forgive. So time went by, and about seven years passed, and they weren't conceiving right away. But through that time of prayer, she conceived. And they had a baby. And it was a baby girl. And ironically, was born on the same day of her abortion, 14 years earlier. It was a sign to this woman and to her family who became believers after that point that God forgives and that God is a God of restoration, that God can restore the years that the locusts have eaten and even the most dreadful sins of our past when they're brought to the foot of the cross can be made new and he makes everything beautiful in its time. God is the giver of life. He's the sustainer of life. I want to finish with one final verse in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 19. Moses had a complicated ministry. The people were not always following him. The people were not always submitting to God's leadership. And he had to lead them through that season. And Moses is coming to the end of his ministry. And he's passing on. He's giving them the final notes. Hey, this is what I want you to pay attention to. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, we read verses 19 and 20. He said, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey him, obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. He tells them there in verse 19, I give you two options. I set before you life and death blessings and cursings it's kind of like you're going into the multiple choice exam i give you this option or i give you this option choose that option that's what god is saying there choose life when it comes to abortion the term pro-choice is a key concept in these verses god presented a choice the most important choice and in fact he gives the answer choose life he screams we can never go wrong in choosing life god always blesses us when we choose life if abortion is part of your past, you've had one, you paid for one, you supported one, you turned a blind eye to one, and you did not speak up, the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive you. Apply it there if you've not yet applied it there. His grace is sufficient. Satan wants to keep you bound in guilt and shame, but if the Son has set you free, you shall be free indeed. And if you give your brokenness to him, he can work it for good. And as a church, are we doing our part to stand up for the unborn? and to help bring life into this world, to protect the sanctity of life. It's not always about having the perfect life or the happiest life or the richest life or the most comfortable life or the most independent life. It's about living a holy life, one that's given over to God and allowing God to be God and honoring him as God even when it's difficult. In doing that, we choose life each and every day, the life that he intended and the life that he blesses. And there's some sobriety in this as well. I thought for my generation at least where one in three of us is gone, 
we are some of the lucky ones. The lives that we live today, it could have been us who have been a part of that 63 million statistic. There's something that we call survivor's guilt. Why did I make it and others did not? So the question for us is, are we living life to the fullest, making the most of every opportunity each day, each breath, each resource? It is a gift from God. The calling upon our life, it is a gift from God. And may we not take it for granted. May we know our purposes and fulfill that fully. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, as we invited you into this place during our worship time at the start of the hour, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your good and gracious voice. We thank you for your spirit that beckons us and calls us to Jesus, that points us to Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would have your way with these words that were shared. Father, that they would continue to minister to our hearts, that they would continue to wash us in this particular area. And Lord, that we would be keen to hear what it is you have for us to do in light of what we've heard. Jesus, thank you that you are a good and gracious God. Lord, thank you for this time at the foot of the cross. Lord, we know that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And as we sang during communion, Lord, amazing grace, how sweet that sound. Lord, whatever our sin is, we praise you and we glorify you that your blood, that your sacrifice, that your death, your resurrection are sufficient to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, by faith, we stand before you anew. We, sta we stand before you uncondemned. And Lord, we know that what your word says, Lord, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we rejoice in that today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> Man, first I want to say thanks so much for listening through to the end. Abortion is such an uncomfortable topic for many to talk about, but such an important one to shed light on. Every day we have the opportunity to choose life, and not just in the realm of the unborn, though that is something that we're surely called to as followers of Jesus, the giver of life. We choose life by searching His Word, by following His ways, by walking in the Spirit. We choose life by living lives of obedience, seeking His will, by fulfilling his call upon us. We choose life by sowing to the Spirit and avoiding the things of the flesh that tear away at us. And God gives us the answers to the test. We have the answer key. Choose life. It's always the best answer. It's always the right answer. And if you've walked with Jesus for any length of time, you've come to see, no doubt, that choosing life is not always easy. The right choice can often be a hard choice, the most difficult choice, requiring more patience, endurance, commitment, resources, faith, trust. But choosing life, the choices God has for us will always be blessed. Stories of redemption are always encouraging, and I'm sure you have some of your own, whether those be redemption stories around the topic of abortion or just redemption stories of those who have chosen new life in Christ. May we take to heart what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 107. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. If you're redeemed, say so. Speak up. Share your story. It brings God glory and defeats the continual lies and work of the enemy. In worship at the church where I gave this message live, just before going up to the stage, we sang Amazing Grace as we took communion. And as we got to the final verse, which says, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And as we sang that verse of hope, a testimony of God's grace, with this world in the rearview mirror and the hope of eternity in view, I saw the worship leader choke up, which made me choke up too. She had just lost her mom and had the funeral a week prior. And that thought of restoration in eternity, it brought joy, the hope of the resurrection, even in her bittersweet moment and her loss of her mother. And while the music played, knowing I was getting up to speak on abortion, I thought of that scene in heaven where God's redemptive work is complete. And I imagined the multitudes of the unborn who never made it to this world victims of the sin and deception of abortion, 63 million plus in our country alone, there worshiping Jesus, praising God, the only father that they have ever known. How many reunions await for the follower of Jesus, even in the wake of abortion? Jesus having paid it all and forgiving it on the cross, truly fulfilling what it says in Revelation 21, 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And that is something we can all truly rejoice in. And in the wake of abortion, I imagine many reunions or first-time introductions taking place as Jesus looks on, smiling. Thanks for listening to these episodes of the Verbatim Word Podcast. I hope sharing this message will encourage you and bless you. It's rare that a church gives the pulpit for an entire Sunday to speak on this topic, and I hope the Lord ministered to you through this as I passed it on via the podcast. Maybe it encouraged you or spoke to you or equipped you to help others choose life, as that is something God truly desires for each of us. We'll be back in the Gospel of Mark on the next episode and look forward to that. Until then, God bless you. Thank you.